Evening from the garden, folks. You won't believe this. My brilliant wife has only gone and picked a load of elderflower. So it looks like I'm making elderflower wine. So in the 1970s, my dad taught me how to do this. Get the elderflowers off. You just go like that in your hand and see how they're all falling into the paper. Just rub it with your fingers. And then you're not getting all the stalk in there as well. You're just getting the flower and that's what you want. And there's the net result of a lot of rubbing. Easily enough now to make a gallon of wine. So here are the elderflower flowers. They're now in a plastic tub. And these are going to go in the fridge overnight. And tomorrow we'll pick this up. Hey folks, it's the next day. I've had my elderflowers in the fridge overnight. Right, so I've added about three litres of water into this pan. I've got some other things in there I'll show you. So I've got two halves of lemon and I've got four tea bags and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a little bit of lemon tea. I'm now going to leave this to come to a simmer. So while my tea is brewing I'm going to prepare my elderflowers or I'm going to sort them out. So I've got in here 250 grams thereabouts so I'm going to take half of these out that's including the weight incidentally of the plastic tub so I need to take that into account also. But I want to take half of those out, pop them in there, and it's going to be half of this amount. So approximately 125 grams of flowers, which is going to go into the tea. And that's what will make the wine must. If you're interested, the other half is going to be used to make some non-alcoholic elderflower cordial. Right, let's have a look at my lemon tea. I think it's safe to say that that's boiling. I shall reduce the heat. Give the tea bags a bit of a squash, a mash, as we say up north. Get the tannins out. That's what we want. Okay, I'm going to take the tea bags out now. They've done their job. It's pretty straightforward, actually. Okay, I'm leaving my lemons in place. And now it's time to add my elderflowers. In they go. I can immediately smell them. They've got such a distinct smell. Brewers would say there's an IPA smell. A lot of people would say it's a bit of a cat pea smell and it is. It is very similar but it's very tasty. Unlike cat pea. Which incidentally I've never tried. So I'm just going to give this a little stir around. I want these to infuse. Okay, and all I'm going to do now is turn the heat off, pop the lid on. I'm going to leave this overnight now and I'm going to come back to it tomorrow when it's a cold mixture. So I'll see you then. Afternoon folks, it's actually the next day now and the elderflower tea has been steeping for 24 hours. So a lot longer than I was initially going to do it, but I think it was a good idea. It smells really, really good, really elderflowery. I'm now going to tip it into the demijohn. I've got a sieve in the sink to catch all the bits so hopefully what we'll go through will be mostly liquid without bits. So that's just going through nicely. It's a nice brown colour and now the flowers are starting to come through. There we go. Smells fantastic. Definite elderflower. I love that smell. So this is what I've got in the demijohn and I'll need to add sugar and water. So there's my big saucepan again and now I've got one kilo of brewing sugar in there and I'm going to add to that just over a litre of spring water. Let that all go in. I'm going to give it a little stir, make sure it's not stuck to the bottom. some heat on and I'm going to warm this through until the sugar dissolves. Okay the brewing sugar has dissolved and I'm now going to add a bit of a strange ingredient and that's a little bit of tomato puree. Now this contains only tomatoes and citric acid and what it will do is it will act as a little bit of a yeast nutrient 
give the yeast something else to feed on because there's not really an awful lot there in terms of uh, elderflowers for them to feed on so this will give them just that little bit of an extra boost and it doesn't leave any tomato -y flavour at all you would never know it was in there. So it looks kind of pretty but I need to just stir it up it'll go pink tinged. I want to break up the pieces of tomato juice that are in there. Sorry tomato puree not tomato juice. There we go, now it looks like a sweet tomato soup. That's exactly what I wanted. And I'm going to pour my sweet tomato -y sugar water into the demijohn through the funnel. I've actually got quite a bit of liquid left in here and the demijohn's nearly full so I'm going to use a slightly bigger fermenting vessel. So this is a Tesco 5 litre water bottle. I'm going to ferment the wine in this. It's just ever so slightly larger than the one gallon demijohn. So I'm just going to transfer now. So I'll add the uh, tomato sugar water now. I'm filling this right up because so I'm going to pour some out to take the gravity and I won't put that back in. So that will leave a hundred mil head space. For the Krausen, I'm not expecting a huge Krausen on this, which is the foamy head that builds on top because there's not a lot of matter in there. But if I do get one and it blows through the airlock, I shall simply replace the airlock with a blow off pipe. So I'm just going to pour 100 mil out messily, oh, very messily, into my hydrometer jar to take the gravity. I put too much in there. I can't take the gravity just yet because this is too warm and I need to take the gravity with a liquid at 20. So I'm just cleaning that. Okay, so I'm just going to have to leave this for a little while. Okay, I've got two ingredients left to add. First one is yeast. I'm using Lalvin EC1118 champagne, sparkling wine and cider yeast. Very good, reliable yeast for winemaking. I'm going to put one heaped teaspoon in and then a third of a teaspoon. After that, I'm going to add some pectolase. Now the pectolase will help clear the wine. Uh, and when you boil fruit, like I have done in this, uh, it can sometimes lead to a wine which is a bit cloudy at the end, so this will help it to clear. I want to put about half a teaspoon in. I need to agitate this now. I want the yeast and the pectolase to sink and mix, which they will do. And that yeast will get very happy in there. It's warm, it's sugary, everything that yeast wants. And there's the nutrient from the tomato paste obviously as well. So this should make hopefully some nice flavour some wine. It's just time to put the airlock in now and then I'm done. For the airlock I've simply bored a hole in the plastic lid for this bottle so if I just screw this on now this should hopefully work. I've got the bung in place and that should hopefully start popping soon. Well 25 minutes in I've got a developed Krausen and bubbles have started to go through the airlock so this is all looking good. I still need to take the original gravity though. Okay, the temperature is now down to 20, so I can take the original gravity of the wort. Nice and buoyant. And I'm starting off with an original gravity of exactly 1.070-1070. Okay, that's it for now. So the next film that you'll see will either be clearing or bottling in a few weeks' time. So I'll catch you then. Hey folks, quick update with my elderflower wine. Here it is. As you can see, it's looking decent. The fermentation has completely stopped. It's been inside this vessel for a month. It is fairly opaque, but not clear. But what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna rack it off from this vessel into this vessel to remove it from the sediment and any bits of sediment which are clinging on these ledges around the edge. So I've got my siphoning tube held in place now with this clip. I will get a bit of sediment from the bottom, but that doesn't matter. And I'll get this into the clean demijohn. Let's do it. Yeah, looks decent. <laughs> Smells like elderflower. I like it. So I've decided not to add any finings because I think that that can impede the sparkle at the end. Sometimes the finings drag all the yeast out of the wine and then it doesn't mix with the sugar that you put in the bottle to make it sparkle. So I'm hoping that this will mean that I will get a sparkling elderflower wine 
and that hopefully will also clear a bit more as well. There we go. Bubbles in the siphoning tube. Tell me that this is now over. And there we go, we can consider that racked off. I often wonder what the Australians think when we talk about racking off. Anyway, I'll come back to this in a few days time and we'll have a look at the colour and clarity of it at that point. Good afternoon from the kitchen folks, it's my elderflower wine bottling day. So here it is. It's cleared pretty nicely in all honesty. Um, it's been in secondary for a week. I've decided now I'm going to move it from here into the bottles so it can condition in the bottles and develop a fizz. So I'm hoping to get six 750ml bottles out of this. I've got a couple of smaller ones in reserve in case I don't quite make that. And for each of the 750ml bottles that I've got I'm going to put a nice generous amount of sugar in. This is just standard household uh, granular sugar and I'm going to put one of those in which is a, a very generous heaped teaspoon for each 750ml bottle. And it's bung out, siphoning tube in. I've got this very handy clip to hold my tube in place. I've got the bottom in the very bottom of the demijohn. There's barely any sediment down there and it doesn't matter if the first bit that comes out is sediment heavy because it's going to go into the hydrometer tube. So let's do it. And it's actually come out clear straight away and into the bottle. <laughs> mm, smells nice actually. Anyway, it's a lovely colour, it's such a lovely orange colour and so clear. So just looking at what's left, I think I'm going to end up with five 750ml bottles and then one of those two. Let's see what happens. I think if I add that to what's in the hydrometer tube, I might be able to fill that small 500 there. If I can't and I don't have any 330ml bottles, then I'll just put it with the tomato paste wash I've got to go through my air still. Before I go any further, I'm going to take the final gravity of this brew and that sank like a good un. Wow, I don't know if I've ever had one sink that much before. I think it's safe to say that that has finished on 0 0.990. Wow. So to work out the alcohol by volume of my elderflower wine, I take the original gravity of 1.070. I deduct from that the final gravity of 0 0.990, that equals 0 0.08 and I multiply this by 131.25 and that equals 10.5%, it's a nice percentage for a wine, I'm happy with that. So I'm just going to see how much I can fit in this bottle. This is from the uh, half bottle that I filled. It might be slightly overcarbed in that bottle because there's a lot more sugar in there than what I would have put in a bottle that size. So when I come to condition this bottle, I'm going to put it somewhere secure in a cardboard box. Okay, so that's the half bottle in there. I'll add what's in the hydrometer tube. Slightly too much headspace, only a bit, but I've got an idea. This is what's left in the siphoning tube. Aha, perfect. Just enough. Let's not waste any. A proper Yorkshireman doesn't waste a bloody drop. Right. I've got my bottles on the sink. I need to get my bungs in place. So I've got my bungs, which are plastic bungs, softening in very hot water. This just helps get them into the bottles because they can sometimes be a bit of a pain. And to that end, I'm also wearing a glove to protect my hand because that's where you get the pain. One, two, three. I always find the posher bottles are the harder ones to get the bungs in. Four. 
Ugh. And five. Right, good stuff. I'm just going to put this bottle to one side and carry on with these ones. So now I've got bones in place. I need cages because that lovely carbon sugar that's in there is going to get munched by any bits of yeast which are left in suspension and hopefully there is some. And when they eat that yeast they'll make alcohol and a byproduct of that will be CO2 which will build pressure up in here and if I don't put the cages on then pop. It's the CO2 build up and the pressure which carbonates the drink and makes it a sparkling wine so you do need to do this. Anyway putting cages on bottles isn't particularly exciting so I'll do all these and come back to you in a minute. So I'm going to bottle this beer bottle, which is an old Erdinger bottle with the Space Invader. I hate this thing, as I keep saying. But I am going to get a bench capper for Christmas, I've decided. I'm going to persevere, because I don't do too many of these kinds of bottles yet. Although by Christmas I might have moved on to corny kegs. Oh God. It's so addictive home brewing, isn't it? And it's down. So you couldn't see that. But I was capping downwards into the sink, uh, basically, so if the bottle slipped, it didn't go everywhere. And it's easier to do it downwards than it is on a work surface. That's capped nicely though, that's really tight. I want to label my bottles, but before I do that, I want to just give them a quick rinse. Because they've got sticky residue on the outside. Look at that colour, that is lovely. That's my bottles topped and washed. I now need to make the labels. I've made my bottle labels up using a simple template in Microsoft Word. I'm just going to print these off. So I'm just going to label my bottles now. I like to take a little bit of pride in their appearance. It's nice to have nice things, isn't it? And, you know, I take a bit of pride about what's on the inside of the bottle. So it's, it's good to have it nicely presented. And there they are. So welcome to the conservatory folks. It's a south facing room. It's summertime. It's really warm. It's a greenhouse basically as you can see and this is where my uh, wine will condition. So my slightly potentially over carbed bottle, I'm going to pop in this box just for safety's sake, under there. And then my other bottles, I'm going to slide down the side. It will not drop below 20 in here, day or night, for the next month at least. So there they all are. I'll be back in about a month's time for the opening and tasting, so I'll see you then. Good evening from the kitchen, folks. It's elderflower, hopefully sparkling wine, opening night. As usual, I'm a little bit excited about this one. I love elderflower wine and I'm really, really hoping that this taste of elderflowers, I want it to have a nice smell. I want it to look good in the glass. I'd love it to have a sparkle and I'd love it to have a nice taste. If I can get three out of four of those things, I'll be happy enough. If I can get all four, I'll be ecstatic. Now looking at the bung, I don't know if you can see, it's risen by about 0.5 mil to one millimetre, maybe. So that is an encouraging sign that possibly this has carved. So let's see what happens. I'm going to use my posh glass today. As soon as they were having sparkling wine, darling. You know, it's almost elderflower champagne. So yeah, I thought I'd try my posh glass. So here goes. Let's get the cage off. I think this cage is at the end of its life. It's getting a bit sharp. Right. Am I going to get a pop? Oh, come on, let's just appreciate that sound. Now, it's got a nice tinge, hasn't it? It's kind of a, a slightly rosy tinge. Rosy, a bit yellowy. Looks a bit like a sparkling urine sample. Don't say that. Right. Oh, yes, that smell. That elderflower smell, it's almost like a, a sweet hoppiness, which fills me with happiness. What does it taste like? It 
it's drier than I expected. I plug it around the medium, medium dry area. I was sort of hoping it would be a medium to a medium sweet, but it's about a medium to medium dry. But do you know what? That's got bags of flavour. Really, really strong elderflower flavour. I'm very happy with the result in all honesty. It's the first time I've made elderflower wine for about 30 years. So yeah, I'm chuffed to bits with that. So anyway, cheers folks. It's been a journey from picking to sampling, but I'm glad I waited. Incidentally, I'd let this condition um, for one month exactly. So two weeks longer than I normally would. Anyway, I'm going to enjoy this one. So cheers, and I'll catch you on the next brew. The film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the home and garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear. If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv. Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.